Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, would like to welcome you all to the webinar linked to the R. Jane Bannister Prize Lecture from the Physiological Society. Uh, this one was awarded in 2019. And uh, I'm hosting this. My name is uh, Stefan Trapp. I'm Professor for Autonomic Neuroscience and Metabolic Disease at UCL. And I'm also, I welcome you here on behalf of the Physi Physiological Society uh, where I'm the international representative and member of the council. So the R. Jane Bannister lecture is awarded annually to a very promising early career scientist and is then delivered three, at, at three or four different locations throughout the UK and Republic of Ireland. Um, this is the first time this year now that we actually give we're having this lecture also as a, as a webinar. We also hope that the live lecture will eventually take place, but due to COVID, we now have a webinar. So this is the first time that we're doing that this year and the live lectures hopefully will happen in 2021. Uh, given that we're now in a kind of electronic format, there's a couple of announcements that I would like to make. So first, this lecture is being recorded and there will actually be an email going out to all attendees after the lecture within a few days, uh, which contains a link to the video of the lecture and also a link to a feedback survey. And we would be really grateful if we could, if you could fill that out because it helps us um, to, uh, to see how, how we're doing with these events from the Physiological Society. Um, secondly, regarding questions for this lecture, you know, we've got a question and answer function in here that I would like you to use to submit your questions, which you can do during the talk, actually. Um, there's also then a tick, spo tick box with it, um, which you can tick if you prefer to remain anonymous. Otherwise, if you give your name, it would be great if you would also give the name of your institution, and we would read both of those out together with the questions, which Marie will then address at the end uh, of the talk. Um, there's also an option to vote for questions which are there already if you think they are particularly important. So any upvoting of those will bring them into the top of the priority list and will be then it will, it will then be addressed first. Right, but now it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Marie Holt from Florida State University. Uh, Marie is originally from Denmark. She completed her first degree in molecular medicine at Aarhus, how I pronounced that correctly, uh, university, and then came to the UK to do a master's degree at Imperial College. She did their biomedical research. And then from there, she went on to do a PhD at UCL, which she actually did in my lab. I was very grateful for her doing that. She was a great student then as well. And uh, yes, then as a postdoc, she moved on to the United States, to Florida, uh, where at Florida State University, which actually is pretty well known as a national leading hub for research into the neuroscience of appetite control and, chem and chemical senses. Uh, and so she joined the lab of Professor Linda Weinemann there and has been working on glucagon like peptide one, its role in food intake and stress. And uh, I assume this will be what she mainly talk about. And actually the very latest news uh, that, that I can tell you is that Marie will actually come back to the UK in early 2021 with a BHF fellowship. Marie has been collecting prizes for best student from her first degree onwards, really, during the master's. I believe she even got two prizes for that. Uh, and as I said, she has been an outstanding PhD student and is, is a really great early career researcher. Today's prize lecture is entitled Mind Effects Matter brainstem circuits linking stress, physiology, and behavior. So, yes, Marie, please take the stage, and we're all eagerly looking forward to the insights that you can share with us here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to start by thanking, first of all, the Society for um, this really great opportunity to share my work, and thank you, of course, to all of you for being here today. Uh, I am really excited to tell you this story. So in 
2013, I started working on this particular subset of neurons in the lower brain stem. They sit all the way back here, the back of the brain, and they're called the GLP-1 neurons. And when I started that work, I don't think I really had any idea how it would take me through so many different aspects of physiology and behavior and how it's given me this really deep appreciation of how much coordination and integration happens at the level of the brain, at the level of the brain stem, and how important that is to our physical and mental well-being. But um, I can get this to work. I cannot. Uh, but before we delve into the science, I just wanted to take a few moments to introduce you all to the woman who this prize lecture is named after. Rachel Jean Bannister. Professor Bannister was a physiologist at Oxford, but she wasn't always set on this science path. When she was very young, she was really into sports and music and only somewhat coincidentally turned to medical science after the Second World War. So I think that her path to science is a really great example of how you don't always have to have it all figured out from the start. Professor Bannister was also a passionate teacher and mentor, and she was a great advocate for women's education. And I've had the chance over the last few years as a postdoc in Linda Reinemann's lab to have a taste of what being a mentor is like. And I have to say that it is, it's kind of addictive. So it feels really fantastic for me to be passing on some of the skills I was taught by others. Other people took the time to teach me and to be paying that forward. And to me, that seems like one of the privileges of science and of academia to always be surrounded by people who are on all the different steps of the science ladder. So we're always at the same time being mentored and, and we're mentoring ourselves. As Stefan said, I was born and bred in Denmark. Um, I grew up on the tip of the nose, if I can get right here in this tiny village um, of about 120 people. And as soon as I could, I moved to Aarhus, which is in fact not very adventurous at all because it's only about an hour from where I grew up, but it was a really great university. And this is where I got my first taste of neuroscience. I completed my bachelor's of science in molecular medicine in 2012. And I then moved to the UK to do a master's of research in biomedical research at Imperial College London. And that really sealed the deal for me. I knew I wanted to become a researcher. I knew that I wanted to study neuroscience. So I then moved on to do a PhD in neuroscience at University College London. And uh, I, I was there for four years with Stefan as my mentor and graduated in 2017 from where I moved to the US, uh, where I am now, uh, doing a postdoc with Linda Reinemann at Florida State University. So in this lecture, I'm gonna be talking about work for my PhD, from my postdoc and I'll be discussing both some published work as well as some more recent unpublished studies that we've done at Florida State. In recent years I've developed an interest in how the brain coordinates responses to stress and how that affects behavior as well as physiology. And so today's talk is really going to be focused on some of the work that we've done to try to understand the, the underlying neural circuits better. So this slide is usually the bit where I tell you why you should care and I give you the stats of the number of people suffering with stress and anxiety. But I'm actually going to skip that spiel today because quite honestly, I don't know anyone who hasn't had this come very close, either personally or to someone we love. So while we normally deal in stats and, and numbers on a daily basis when we do science, I think that by just remembering that this condition affects people on a very personal, a very individual level, we realize that it's important to study. So instead of giving you stats, I give you this quote by Søren Kierkegaard, who's a Danish philosopher, and he introduced the rest of the world to the Danish term angst, which roughly translates to anxiety or fear or, or dread. So here it goes. Just as a physician might say that there is very likely not one single living human being who's completely healthy. So anyone who really knows mankind might say there is not one single living human being who does not secretly harbor an unrest, an inner strife, a disharmony, an anxiety about an unknown something. So for Kierkegaard, anxiety or dread, or using again the Danish word angst is unfocused fear. And in today's world, we may think about that fear 
as, as worry or stress. And this repeated unrelenting constant stress can induce an anxiety state that's characterized by behavioral inhibition. We withdraw, we have a hard time making decisions. Vigilance, we feel jumpy, irritable, we feel ready, and we may have a hard time sleeping. And sympathetic arousal, which is an increase in, in blood pressure and heart rate. And in the long term, this can contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal disorders, mood disorders, just to name a few. But of course, at its core, stress is beneficial. In response to perceived threats, the brain prepares the body for potential threats and ensures that our physiology returns to normal. In fact, small doses of stress, which we successfully recover from, can make us better prepared for future threats. When we're in a stressful situation, we experience a range of emotional and physiological symptoms, and I've listed some of them here. This bodily response and mental response to stress roughly comes down to three processes. So we have sympathetic activation, which drives this increase in heart rate and blood pressure. We get a dry mouth, and that's a very fast response. More slowly, we get activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, which leads to release of the stress hormone cortisol. And then there are behavioral changes in response to stress. So we may experience that we're more vigilant, we feel more ready. And with acute stress, people often experience a decrease in appetite. So the brain is prioritizing this immediate threat over potential hunger. All of those responses are ultimately controlled by the brain. So this is the mouse brain. It's been sectioned um, down through the middle. And I've highlighted here some of the regions that are known to be involved in the brain's responses to stress. And I think actually what's interesting when you look at this is that a lot of these areas are what we call subcortical. So while stress is very much an emotion that we have and we're very conscious of, a lot of the processing of that emotion happens at the subcortical level. So in regions that we don't normally associate with conscious thought particularly well known for their roles in stress and fear processing are the hypothalamus and the central amygdala. But in fact, um, what I'll show you today is that this small nucleus at the back of the brain, the nucleus of the solitary tract, or the NTS, is likely essential to some of the most fundamental aspects of stress. So if you take a cross section through the lower brainstem, you can see the NTS is situated up here towards the dorsal surface. The NTS receives input from the rest of the body and serves to integrate that information with higher order input and thereby modulate essential functions, including breathing and cardiovascular and gastrointestinal function. So considering this importance of the NTS in modulating these very essential functions and the impact of stress on those functions, it's perhaps not so surprising that the NTS is profoundly sensitive to acute stress. In fact, if you expose a mouse to 30 minutes of strain stress by placing them in a plastic bag, and they have a breathing hole here at the front, you get an increase in the number of activated neurons in the NTS. And that we can measure here by labeling for CFOS, an immediate early gene that is an indicator of recent increases in neural activity. So you can see here in the no stressed animal, there is a few um, CFOS labeled cells in the NTS, but you expose an animal to stress and you get this huge increase in the number of CFOS activated neurons. I just want to take a moment to properly explain the graph here on the right, because it includes a visualization of the effect size and it's 95% confidence interval. So in this case, the effect size is the difference in the number of CFOS positive neurons in the NTS between the unstressed and the stressed mice. And that gives us much more information about the magnitude of the effect that we're seeing than the actual P value. But as you can see, stress, increases in the number of CFOS positive neurons in the NTS. The NTS is made up of many different types of neurons and this list here is by no means exhaustive. What's also important to remember is that of course, many of these cell types, cell types are somewhat overlapping. So um, a subset of TH positive cells, for instance, express PRP and many of the cell types here uh, express leptin receptor. And with advances in single cell RNA sequencing, we are getting a much better appreciation of how heterogeneous these neuronal cell populations really are. 
And my work since my master's research has been focused on these NTS neurons, um, the glucagon-like peptide one neurons. Glucagon-like peptide one, GLP-1, is encoded in the glucagon gene. And the pre-proglucagon mRNA that's uh, made from that is translated into proglucagon and undergoes then tissue-specific um, post-translational cleaving into GLP-1, as well as a number of other peptides. So that GLP-1 is produced in the central nervous system and in the gut. And these GLP-1 producing neurons, as I mentioned, are found in the NTS in the lower brainstem. So again, down here. So again, if we take a cross section, you can see uh, stained for here, this is the NTS. And here you see the stain for GLP-1 in grayscale. There's also a population of these neurons in the intermediate reticular nucleus and in the olfactory bulb. But today I'm gonna to be focusing on this NTS population. And before we move on, I just want to convince you that all of this is also interesting from a human perspective. So here you can see that um, GLP-1 is expressed in the rat brainstem, in the mouse brainstem, as I showed you before, but also in the human brainstem. So this expression is really well conserved between species. So the effects of GLP-1 within the brain have been studied since the 1990s, and it was quite early on discovered that GLP-1 has profound effects on food intake. But while GLP-1 is perhaps best known for its role in appetite suppression, when you inject it directly into the brain, it actually has wide effects on motivated behavior and physiology, including many aspects of stress responses. So based on what we knew about this very broad effect of GLP-1, we were wondering if perhaps these neurons were actually part of a much wider response to either emotional or physical threats to the well-being of the animal. But to study the role of GLP-1 neurons in vivo, we had to get a handle on these cells. So before I go into what we found, I want to bring everybody up to speed on the tools I use to generate our data. Some of you will probably be very familiar with these techniques. So designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs, DREDs, are these cleverly repurposed G-protein coupled receptors, which um, will only be activated by the otherwise uh, inner ligand clozapine and oxide, CNL. So by expressing these receptors on the surface of neurons, you can manipulate their activity through delivery of CNL. And that allows us to either acutely turn on or off neuronal signaling. So if we express the HM3DQ receptor, we turn on neuronal firing. And if we express the HM4DI receptor, we turn off neuronal firing. And then to be able to manipulate the GLP-1 neurons selectively using these tools, we needed a way to express the molecules in a very selective manner. And to do that, we used transgenic mice expressing Cre recombinase under the control of the glucagon promoter. So as you remember from a few slides ago, GLP-1 is encoded in the glucagon gene and Cre expression in these mice is therefore confined to cells expressing GLP-1 or glucagon. So in the brain, the GLP-1 neurons will express Cre. These mice also express a red fluorescent protein, TDRFP, in a Cre-dependent manner so that both Cre and TDRFP expression within the brain is confined to GLP-1 neurons. And to confirm that, we took brain sections from these mice and ran RNA scope in situ hybridization for the preproglucagon mRNA. So that's what you see here, as well as immunofluorescence for DS red to detect TDRFP. And we get this perfect overlap between the two, demonstrating that these Cre expressing cells are, in fact, the GLP 1 neurons. To achieve high levels of expression of the HM3DQ receptor in GLP-1 neurons selectively, we stereotactically injected these mice with an adeno-associated virus, an AAV, which encodes the HM3DQ receptor in a Cre-dependent manner. So because of the way the virally delivered DNA is constructed, while the virus does infect all the cells in the injection site, only cells with Cre will actually express the receptor. Conveniently, most of these viruses also express a fluorescent reporter, in this case, M. cherry, so that we can confirm that the cells expressing the receptor are in fact the GLP-1 neurons. Also as a control for viral expression, we typically will inject another cohort of mice with a virus only expressing the fluorescent reporter, M. cherry, 
and it doesn't have the dread receptor. So again, we use RNA scope in situ hybridization to identify the GLP-1 neurons, and we use an m cherry specific antibody to label the HM3DQ receptor. And when we quantify that, we see almost perfect efficiency and selectivity of this approach. And by that, I mean that almost all PPG expressing cells express the virus. And almost all of the virus expressing cells are in fact GLP-1 neurons. So that means that we are effectively activating all of the GLP-1 neurons and none of the other neurons. So we know that this expression is efficient and selective, but can we actually activate the cells using this approach? So we looked at that both ex vivo and in vivo. We sectioned a brainstem of a mouse expressing the calcium indicator GCAMP3, as well as HM3DQ in the GLP-1 neuron selectively. And we showed that superfusion of, of these sections with CNO led to an increase in intracellular calcium, which is what we'd expect with an increase in neuronal firing. And that was then confirmed later in vivo by injecting these HM3DQ expressing mice with CNO. So here the immuno labeling is for CFOS in black, which you can see down here. Um, so that indicates neural activity. And in brown is this DS red stain labeling the GLP-1 neurons. And you can see under control conditions, we have three different control conditions. This is a control virus expressing mouse injected with CNO, control virus in expressing mouse injected with saline, and then HM3DQ expressing mouse injected with saline. And none of these are expressing CNO, are expressing CFOS at significant levels. Um, and you can see over here that that amounts to about 10% of the cells activated. But if you inject an HM3DQ expressing mouse with CNO, you get this huge increase in the number of activated neurons. And that's quantified over here. You see that. Um, when we quantify that, we see an increase in the number of these activated GLP-1 neurons by about 50 percentage points. So now we know we can chemogenetically activate those neurons. What happens when we do? Now, considering the effects of central GLP-1 on appetite, it wasn't surprising to us that, we, that chemogenetic activation of these neurons significantly suppresses feeding. I think what was perhaps surprising was how robust the effect really is. So on this graph, there's time on the x-axis after onset of dark. This is when mice usually will have their food. And, um, and on the y-axis is the amount of food that they've eaten. And you can see when you inhibit the GLP-1 neurons, you get this suppression in feeding over six hours. The first hour, you can see again, there's a suppression of feeding when you inhibit the GLP-1 neurons. And that's now been confirmed by many different labs. I recently repeated some of those experiments in my postdoc lab, and I found that this effect is mostly driven by an increase in the latency to begin feeding. So it takes the mice about 25 minutes longer to start eating at dark onset, as well as a decrease in the size of the first meal by about um, 0.09 of a gram. But of course, just because a neuron is capable of driving a behavior doesn't mean that it ever actually participates in the modulation of that behavior during normal physiology. We are, after all, if you think about it, we're kind of hitting the, hammer, the system with a bit of a hammer when we do chemogenetic activation. So to answer the question, we set out to answer what is the physiological role of these neurons, we had to turn to chemogenetic inhibition instead. So we injected these same mice with a virus encoding the inhibitory dread, HM4DI, and we then confirmed again, both ex vivo and in vivo, that this allows us to inhibit these neurons. So first here you see using patch clamp electrophysiology, we're able to show the application of CNO um, to the recording bath suppresses firing of GLP-1 neurons by almost one hertz. And in vivo, we find that if you inject these mice with CNO, you reduce the number of CFOS positive GLP-1 neurons from about 55% to about 30%. So based on that, we're happy to conclude that we can selectively inhibit the GLP-1 neurons using this approach. But when we looked at the feeding behavior of these animals after injection of CNO, there was virtually no change. So when you inject these animals with CNO, their food intake is exactly the same as when you inject them with saline. And I recently confirmed that in my postdoc lab as well. 
So we were somewhat perplexed by these findings that inhibition had no effect on feeding, in particular given this very robust effect that we were seeing with chemogenetic activation. So we did a little bit of detective work, and there's been plenty of evidence in the literature to suggest that if you limit GLP-1 receptor signaling in the brain, or if you um, reduce the amount of GLP-1 available in the brain, you get increases in food intake. This has been demonstrated in rats, although in, in mice, it seems to not be quite as straightforward. So first we were wondering, well, how do we capture a physiological state where these neurons are normally active? Because if they're not active, then you wouldn't expect inhibition of them to have any effect at all. So perhaps we were just not really asking the mice at the right time, so to speak. So when are these neurons active? Well, Jamie Maniscalco in Linda Reinemann's lab showed a few years ago that these cells are particularly sensitive to stress. So acute stress leads to a robust increase in CFOS positive GLP-1 neurons. And that was later confirmed um, by Sarah Terrell in Diana Williams' lab in mice. So you see here that you get this robust increase in the number of activated GLP-1 neurons in response to restraint stress. So to test if GLP-1 neurons mediate suppression and appetite, so this reduction in feeding that we see after acute stress, we used the same mice where we previously saw no effect of chemogenetic inhibition of these neurons, and now injected the CNO prior to 30 minutes acute restraint. And strikingly, we found that this decrease in food intake you see in the control animals in response to stress was completely prevented by removing GLP-1 neuron activity. So it appears that these neurons play a really important role in mediating stress-induced hyperphagia, so this decrease in feeding following stress. But I did make a point earlier in telling you that GLP-1 has many effects in the brain. And I think if we want to think about GLP-1 neurons as essential in mediating stress responses, then we would expect to find effects of manipulating those neurons on other aspects of stress, including, for instance, anxiety-like behavior. Anxiety-like behavior is a term used to describe behavior in rodents typically associated with an anxious state. Now, because we can't ask the rodents if they're feeling anxious, we use a number of tests to assess their behavior. Until now, there's been some evidence in the literature to suggest that, that GLP-1 within the brain is involved in modulating anxiety-like behavior. So to answer that question, we again express the excitatory dread receptor, HM3DQ, in GLP-1 neurons selectively. And several weeks later, we tested them in the open field. The open field is simply a box that the animal hasn't seen before, so it's a new environment to them. And then you just follow their movement around the box. And this test relies on uh, rodents' natural exploratory behavior. So you put them in a new environment, they're gonna want to explore it. Um, when an animal is, is more anxious, it tends to stick to the sides and to the corners, and they'll prefer to avoid the center of the arena where it feels more exposed. So we use the time spent in the center as a measure of how anxious an animal is. And using this technique, we found that activation of GLP-1 neurons was sufficient to induce moderate anxiety-like behavior in females. So it decreased the time spent in the center of the open field by 71 seconds. And it also decreased the overall distance traveled by the females. But we saw no effect in the males, although I will add that there is a huge variability here that could make it hard to pick up any differences. So since one behavioral test shouldn't really stand alone, and given that we did find this reduction in, in, in um, the distance traveled following GLP-1 neuron activation, we also wanted to test the mice in a paradigm that isn't reliant on, on movement and exploratory behavior. And for that, we chose the acoustic startle paradigm. Here, mice are placed in a plexiglass tube. So this is a rat, but you can just imagine it a little smaller. Um, they have room for movement. And after the habituation period, you play loud noises at three different decibel levels at random intervals and then you record the amplitude of their jump in response to that uh, noise. And actually we use a similar test to assess anxiety in humans and in humans and rodents, 
more uh, the more anxious creature will exhibit a higher startle amplitude. So on this graph, startle amplitude is plotted on the y-axis and uh, the decibel level is, is plotted on the x-axis. Each animal is then measured several times at each decibel level. And an average startle amplitude for each mouse is calculated at that level. And the first thing you will notice with these data is that with increasing decibel levels, you get an increase in startle amplitude. Um, and that's, that's what you would expect really, that's a louder noise will produce a higher startle. So in control animals, what you also see is that there was this subtle but statistically significant decrease in startle after treatment with CNL. So that's been suggested or demonstrated in rats as well, and we somewhat expected that. But while CNO decreased startle in control mice, treatment with CNO actually increased startle in HM3DQ expressing mice, suggesting that not only does GLP-1 neuron activation rescue the reduction in starting, startle following CNO treatment, but it also induces a significant anxiogenic effect. So in summary, we show that GLP-1 neurons have the ability to promote anxiety-like behaviors in mice. But of course, we all know, I mentioned before, um, sufficiency doesn't prove necessity. So just because we can induce these behaviors by hitting the system with a hammer, doesn't mean that these cells are ever actually involved. So similar to before, we next tested whether GLP-1 neurons are required for anxiety-like responses to stress using chemogenetic inhibition to remove GLP-1 neuron activity. So again, these glucose mice were injected with a virus expressing the inhibitory dread receptor HM4DI. And several weeks later, we then tested them in the open field again. These mice were injected with CNO and 15 minutes later, they were exposed to acute restraint and then placed in the open field. But as you can see, there was absolutely no effect on the time spent in the center in males and females, and no effect on the, on the total distance traveled in males and females. So next we tested whether GLP-1 neurons are required for stress-induced changes in the acoustic startle paradigm. We measured their acoustic startle under three conditions, following saline injection, following CNO injection, and following CNO injection combined with 30 minutes restraint stress. So that way we can assess the effect of GLP-1 neuron inhibition on both baseline and stress enhanced startle. We also measured their startle, not just in the dark, but also in the light. Mice are usually tested in the dark and when you test them in the light, the, in the light their responses become larger. And that's what we usually refer to as a light enhanced startle. It actually is it's the opposite of what you'd expect in humans, where if you put a human in a, in a completely dark room, they might become more anxious and more jumpy. But mice find light more aversive than dark. So again, average startle amplitude is plotted on the y-axis with decibel levels on the x-axis. And in darker shaded bars, you see data from measurements in the dark with lighter shaded bars showing data from the light. In both the control, this is the control group and the inhibitory dread group, there was a significant increase in startle amplitude under the light condition in the saline injected animals. Uh, and that's what we call this light enhanced startle. When animals were pre-treated with CNO, that light enhanced startle disappeared in both groups, suggesting again that CNO on its own may suppress anxiety-like behavior. However, control mice that were injected with CNO but then exposed to acute restraint stress for 30 minutes had this light enhanced startle again appear. Um, interestingly, though, this stress-induced light-enhanced startle was not seen in mice with chemogenetic inhibition of the GLP-1 neurons. So that suggests to me that GLP-1 neurons may contribute specifically to the increase in startle in response to a stressful condition, so exposure to light, only in mice already exposed to acute stress. So based on the evidence collected by us and many others, we end up with this model. So as I told you at the beginning, stress leads to an increase in HPA axis activity. It leads to an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity. And it leads to changes in behavior 
And it's becoming increasingly evident that GLP-1 within the brain plays a central role in many of these processes. So there's um, plenty of evidence out there that GLP-1 regulates the AHPA axis. Uh, we have data showing that GLP-1 increases heart rate and that if you chemogenetically activate the GLP-1 neurons, you get an increase in heart rate. I didn't have time to show you that today. We um, know that GLP-1 and the GLP-1 neurons are essential for these changes in feeding and anxiety-like behavior in response to stress. But we were starting to wonder if we could identify where in the brain the signal of stress is coming from, which brain regions are telling the GLP-1 neurons and the NTS that, hey, something's up. So to investigate that, we, we looked at the literature and there's been a lot of studies showing um, the central input, the brain inputs to the NTS in the rat, but we were struggling to find uh, any data from mice. So we went ahead and did this ourselves. So these mice were injected with a traditional retrograde tracer chlorotoxin B, which gets taken up by terminals and gets transported to the cell body. So if a, if a, a neuron is projecting to a brain region, it takes up the CTB and the CTB gets transported back to the cell body. And that way you can create this map of where, if you inject it into the NTS, where's the NTS getting its input from? And you end up with something like this, this map of brain regions that project directly to the NTS. But we really wanted to know, so now we have a map of which brain regions project to the NTS, but we really wanted to know which brain regions provide input specifically to the GLP-1 neurons. So to answer that, we did cell selective monosynaptic retrograde tracing from the GLP-1 neurons using a rabies virus approach. So rabies virus has this really convenient trait that it can jump backwards from neuron to neuron. But the rabies virus that we used has been modified in two important ways. So first, it's envelope A pseudotyped so that it can only infect, and this is what sits here on the surface. So you can, it can only infect cells that express a certain receptor, the TVA receptor on the membrane. And secondly, the glycoprotein G, which is necessary for this jumping, the, the transsynaptic spread has been deleted from this virus. So in the absence of G, this virus can't propagate to upstream neurons. Okay, so it just kind of gets stuck in the neuron that it's infected. But by supplying the virus with a glycoprotein G from an adeno-associated helper virus, we can ensure that this virus only jumps one synapse. So to map the monosynaptic input to GLP-1 neurons, we use two Cree-dependent helper virus carrying the TVA receptor and the rabies G. And TVA and G are then expressed only in GLP-1 neurons. And that allows for infection of those neurons and retrograde spread across one synapse. But importantly, since these upstream neurons that are now infected, they don't express the glycoprotein G, this virus can't propagate to second order inputs. So we injected a cocktail of these AAVs uh, into the NTS and 21 days later, we injected the rabies virus. And seven days later, these animals were then perfuse fixed and GFP was detected in the NTS. And you can see here GLP-1 neurons in magenta um, infected with this virus. And using this technique, we then mapped the, all of the brain regions that supply input to the GLP-1 neurons. And I'm not gonna go into details here, but I do think this is a really um, cool way to, it's a great starting point for thinking about how these different populations of neurons involved in, in, in these processes may sort of affect each other. And we were particularly intrigued by the high level of input from the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, the PVN. Uh, I did mention it earlier as one of those regions really important for stress regulation. And, and there is a wealth of data out there showing that it is one of the essential regions, both for appetite regulation and stress modulation. So using that conventional tracing technique I described earlier, uh, CTB, in combination with acute stress exposure, we found that these PVN neurons that project directly to the NTS um, are activated following acute restraint. So here you see that the, the proportion of PVN neurons projecting to the NTS, these are the only ones we're counting here, um, activated in 
in non-handled animals, and that increases significantly in, in stressed animals. So, so we knew that these NTS projecting PVN neurons were activated in response to stress, this pathway is activated in response to stress. So to get a sense of whether PVN neurons may drive stress-induced activation of GLP-1 neurons, we labeled sections from these um, rabies-injected animals for both GFP and CFOS as a marker of neural activation. So you can see here in grayscale are the rabies-infected PVN neurons that project to GLP-1 neurons, and in magenta are CFOS-labeled neurons. And you get this increase in, in the activation of GLP-1-projecting PVN neurons in response to stress. So having identified then this PVN to NTS pathway as the potential mediator of stress-induced activation of GLP-1 neurons, we wanted to try to selectively inhibit that input, thinking that maybe we would be able to then suppress the activation of GLP-1 neurons in response to stress. So to do that, we injected a retrograde AAV encoding Cree recombinase into the NTS. This virus then gets taken up by neuronal fibers and it gets transported back to the cell body. So this means that any neuron projecting directly to the NTS will express Cree. So we also then injected a Cree-dependent AAV encoding either the inhibitory dread HM4DI or GFP as a control. And that went into the PVN. And that then results in expression of HM4DI or GFP in PVN neurons projecting specifically to the NTS. And that's where you can see down here, this is GFP in PVN neurons projecting to the NTS. These mice were then injected with CNL, exposed to 20 minutes in the open field, which is a moderately stressful stimulus for a mouse, and then transcardially perfused with fixative. And as expected, you can see here that chemogenetic inhibition of this pathway of these neurons significantly decreased activation of these PVN neurons. So that's what we're looking for. We wanted to inhibit those cells. When looking at activation of the NTS, we did see a trend towards decreased CFOS uh, labeling in these mice with chemogenetic inhibition of that specific pathway. Interestingly, selective inhibition of this PVN to NTS pathway did significantly decrease the number of activated GLP-1 neurons following this moderate stress. So in summary, we find that stress activates a group of PVN neurons that project directly to GOP-1 producing neurons in the NTS. I didn't show you the data for this, but these PVN neurons express the stress neuropeptide CRH. And we show that this PVN input to the NTS is necessary for stress-induced activation of GOP-1 neurons. Activation of GOP-1 neurons following stress then leads to decreased food intake increased sympathetic activation, increased HPA axis activation, and anxiety-like behavior. So that suggests that GLP-1 neurons may contribute to a very wide response to stress, and they drive these typical processes and behaviors that I told you at the beginning are associated with a high anxiety state, so behavioral inhibition and sympathetic arousal. I think when I was first taught about our brain and the way it functions at university. I was taught that we have a part of our nervous system that we can control, which is conscious, we think and we move. And then we have a section of our nervous system which we have no control over, which we call the autonomic nervous system. It's in control of itself. And this system controls fundamental processes which keep us alive and it's like a heart rate and blood pressure, digestion and that kind of thing. But what's becoming increasingly obvious through research is that these two systems are completely intertwined. So mood disorders definitely affect our bodies and the function of our bodies. And our bodies have a huge impact on our mood. And that integration has to happen somewhere. And I think the NTS and within it, the GOP-1 neurons may play an essential role in that integration. And if we can understand that, and if we can understand how these circuits are affected during chronic stress, for instance, which is where I'm planning to take my research next, then perhaps we can use that knowledge to develop new therapies. And I think, and this is important to me too, that that has to be both pharmacologically, but certainly also cognitive. So appreciating how our minds um, can affect 
our bodies. And with that, the most important slide of the day, um, my mentors, um, Stefan, thank you, and Linda Reinemann, who I'm working with now, have been instrumental in, in getting me to where I am. Uh, my colleagues in those labs and the people who helped with this work, um, the funding sources, of course, and then, of course, the mice who endure so much for the advancement of science. And um, I hope you have some questions for me. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Right. Thank you very much, Mui, for a really exciting, interesting talk. And yes, I hope we get a lot of questions here. Can I actually remind everyone to please post your questions on that question and answer site because we have to go through those. We've got so many participants in here at the moment. It's 155 participants that we have that uh, it would be very difficult to do this live with everyone showing their hands. So please uh, ask your questions on the um, within the question and answer session or there. And uh, yes, if I can actually start uh, with uh, asking Mui those questions that we've, that we've got in here already. Um, so Mui, the first question that we've got here, which is actually from an anonymous attendee, is how did you ensure the CFOS activation in the NTS of mice put in a plastic bag are due to stress and not hypoxia? And then the back considering the role of NTS in respiratory functionality as well. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's a very reasonable question. Um, so they, they can breathe. They have a breathing hole at the front and their respiration is not obstructed in any way. Um, I will also say to that, that, that that type of stress is not the only type of stress that activates the NTS. So you can, for instance, this has been, I don't know of, data in mice, but in rats, it's been demonstrated if you place them on a on an elevated platform, for instance, you get um, an increase in CFOS activation. And that obviously is, is not um, due to obstruction of breathing. Um, also, when we place them in the open field, which is this moderately stressful situation for them, we also see this increase in CFOS activation. So Okay, well, thank you very much. And the next question that we have is from Joe Lewis uh, from the University of Cambridge, who says, excellent talk, Mui. Thank you, and congratulations on the BHF Fellowship. Thank you. The question is, does acute activation reduce overall particular locomotor activity in mice? I.e., does the animal just feel unwell and therefore does not consume food, explore, etc.? Yeah, I think that's a very valid question. And, and honestly, there's very mixed data on it. And so um, I've done a little bit of that, but I don't have that much data on the, the just pure locomotion. So as you could see in the open field data in the females, we did get this reduced distance traveled. Um, and but it's hard to say from that experiment exactly what's what's the what's the sort of reason we can't ask the mice why have you stopped moving? Um, there has been some other data suggesting that central GLP-1, GLP-1 in the brain affects locomotion. But I think it's, it is hard to separate when you're using these tests that are reliant on locomotion and on exploratory behavior, you kind of, it does become a bit messy there. And that's why I think it is really important to have these several different types of tests that sort of rely on different aspects of anxiety-like behavior, which is why we chose to use this, um, this acoustic startle paradigm as well, where you're not relying on the animal moving around. I think the data are just, yeah, the jury's still out a little bit on locomotion, yeah. So, so you would say it's not that they don't move, that they don't eat because they feel unwell, you think? Oh, no, so, so I think, um, <laughs> again, when it comes to malaise and sort of feeling unwell, there's a wealth of data with GOP1 and quite a lot showing I think that it's, it doesn't induce an awful lot of malaise activating these cells, but yeah, this isn't, I don't want to give a definitive answer on that one. Let me, let me put it that way. Yeah. And obviously all these things kind of play into each other as well, you know, so 
So in a mouse, we can't, we can't ask it why, why are you not eating? Why, why are you sitting in a corner and not exploring? You know, so we have ways of trying to address those questions, but I haven't personally done any of those malaise mm. studies myself. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, another question from Joe Lewis was then, with the startle test, are these naive mice? Does repeated testing alter the response? No, so that's one of the great things about the acoustic startle paradigm too, because with a lot of the other tests, we are relying on this, this novelty as being part of it. So if you expose a mouse to the open field, it has to be a novel environment, otherwise they're not going to explore it, right? Um, but with the acoustic startle, you can, you can re-expose them and, and we don't see any difference in the response. And also, so these are counterbalanced uh, experiments, so, you know, on, they're exposed at different on different days to CNO and saline. So yeah, that's one of the great things about this test. Okay. Um, then the next question that we have here is from Estefania Asavido, who says again, great talk. Uh, what are your thoughts on molecular mechanisms by which GLP-1 neurons in the NTS are being activated by the PVH neurons? Mm. Do they express COH receptors? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Yeah, I um, I actually have a little bit of data on that. I did an RNA scope in situ hybridization, and and we do see some evidence that there are CRH receptors on on the GLP-1 neurons themselves, which I think is is really exciting. Um, but but that's all. That's all I have. I don't have any functional data or anything like that. Yeah. And then the next question goes towards uh, depression type behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. Smart asks, does GLP-1 receptor activation have any effect on depression type behavior? Right. So there's, there's actually a, a big part of GLP-1 literature now that's looking at um, antidepressive effects of GLP-1. And then I think we're, 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 we're getting into more, GLP-1 also has neuroprotective effects. Um, and, and, and then we're starting to move into some of more of those kinds of effects. So actually, it's a bit the opposite of what you'd expect based on this, this, this role in, in acute stress and anxiety-like behavior. It actually seems like if you treat people with, with GLP-1 or if you treat mice and rodents with GLP-1 receptor agonists, you get this antidepressive effects. So I, d I don't really know that much about that part of the GLP-1 literature, if I'm honest. We haven't tested depressive-like effects. Um, yeah, that's a whole other thing to go into that I, I, haven't, I haven't tested in these mice. Okay, thank you. Um, then next question is from uh, Beatrice Filippi from Leeds. She's asking, would the knockdown, sorry, would knockdown GLP-1 expression in GLP-1 neurons work the same way as threat inhibition. As, as the chemogenetic inhibition, sorry. As the chemogenetic, yes. Yeah, um, so the short answer is no. Um, these neurons express other things than just GLP-1. Uh, we have good reason to think there's been a, some studies, maybe one study, showing that at least the food intake suppressive effects of activating these cells are dependent on GLP-1. Oh, two studies, I think, now, actually. So, so we have pretty good evidence that at least those effects, the food intake suppressive effects, are dependent on the GLP-1 produced by these cells. But of course, these cells also express other things. They express glutamate, for instance. So, so when you chemogenetically inhib inhibit them, you also remove the glutamate signaling, right? But if you knock down the GLP-1, you knock down the preproglucagon, you're only removing GLP-1. So those are going to be two different things. We haven't, um, we haven't done that, knock down the, the, the PPG, but other labs have done, it's been done now in mice. And um, as far as, uh, Stefan, you might remember this better than me, but I can't remember any baseline effects of that on feeding, but it is necessary for this chemogenetic activation to reduce feeding. Um, but in rats, of course, there's data showing that if you knock down GLP-1, you knock down PPG expression, you get an increase in feeding behavior. So yeah, there's different, it could be a species difference for all I know. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would also say the tool is still out there of uh, yeah. how much of an overlap of effect there is. Because yeah. Because we don't know exactly how much is GLP-1 and how much is, is the glutamate. Yeah, and that can be, that can be tricky to address, yeah. Uh, we'll be interesting experiments, I think, too. Yeah, for sure. All right, then we've got a, a question here from Mujahidit Nazir, who asks, I used... I used to feel fever sometimes after experiencing stress. I need an explanation. <laughs> yeah, I might not be the right person there. Um, yeah, I, it's uh, we were talking about fever, and now I need Linda, my current mentor, who's much more of an expert on this sort of thing, um, and GOP1. Uh, and I think she did some studies with that, but I yeah no this is way way out of my comfort zone uh if i'm honest stress and fever yeah so uh, no to be fair okay uh i do i have done some experiments in mice um just finding it in my brain um if you expose a mouse to acute stress you get an increase in body temperature and i've, I've actually just done these experiments um but that doesn't seem to be dependent on the gop1 system as far as i can tell so yeah, there is this there is this thing that's stress induced hypothermia. So you get, you know, your your body is basically sort of getting ready. You know, it's it's not like a fever, but it's it's like an increase in in body temperature. Yeah. In, in a way, that would actually link very much to a question that I would is not. And here is a question that I would ask, and maybe I can just interject that now. Just, so from your talk, I get this impression that, of course. It, GLP, these GLP-1 units, they seem to be very central almost to the to the response to stress. Does that mean they are mediating kind of all or many of the aspects of stress? And, and my question there goes towards, if I think there's a lot of studies where GLP-1, for example, has been injected into the brain. Mm. And, uh, well, we're also thinking about that as kind of therapy to, to hit GLP-1 receptors in the brain to reduce food intake. But does mm really mean that what we're actually doing is we are producing a strong stress response and I guess we wouldn't want that in our patients for obesity or so. Yeah, I mean, so when we're in, when we're injecting patients with, I mean, you know, that's... We wouldn't do it with patients, but... Yeah, I mean, that. yeah, so, so it depends. It's different to, to target, uh, you know, centrally into the brain, which obviously we don't do with humans, but we can do that with rodents. I think these cells have the ability to control many of these processes, but of course, it, it's most likely mediated by different brain regions, right? So the food intake aspect of things might be mediated by certain brain regions like the PVN, right? Whereas maybe the anxiety-like behavior aspect of things is more mediated by the, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis or the lateral septum or, you know, so, it probably depends on where you put that GLP-1, what, what kind of effect you'll get. And that's actually been shown by Randy Seeley's group like in 2003 or something that you get differential effects depending on where you put your GLP-1 receptor agonist. So I don't think, I think if you just put GLP-1 into the brain of a rodent, you're gonna get all this multitude of responses and it just depends on what are you measuring, right? But if you target specific, maybe even specific types of GOP1 neurons, the ones that project to the BNST, the ones that project to the PVN, you might get different responses. But that, I, you know, I'm, I'm just speculating on that one. All right, thanks. Um, we actually, it's, it's now four o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in that respect at the end of the question. We probably, probably can do another minute or so. Um, we've got a lot more open questions in the forum at the moment. So uh, maybe I just post the next two or three and if you would be happy to answer the remaining questions, maybe in an email or so, uh, that, that can then be given uh, to the people who post the question, or maybe even, even everyone who's, who's attended, that, that would be great. I'll uh, do my best. But we, have to, we have to finish within a few minutes. Mm -hmm. here. So if I, yes, go just to a, to a couple more questions. So there is one from Jim Dukas from Leeds, mm -hmm. um, saying, very clear and enjoyable talk, thank you. Looking at the PVN CFOS staining there, were many uh, staining there were many more CFOS positive than rabies labeled. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Any idea where these cells project to? 
Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> I mean, so first of all, I would say the rabies virus approach is not 100% efficient. Okay. I get very um, different numbers of labeled cells in different mice. It's actually quite difficult to get, you know, so I, I think that's, that's one of the first answers. I think you know, this is guesswork, but I think that there are more PVN neurons than what I'm picking up that are actually projecting to the GLP-1 neurons. But of course, it's not all of them in the PVN that are activated that project to the GLP-1 neurons. There's going to be other brain regions involved. And of course, the PVN is this master center for, for stress regulation. And I have done a little bit uh, looking at, um, you know, this, this tracing from the PVN to the NTS. So if I label only neurons that project from the PVN to the NTS with a GFP, I can also then ask the question, okay, well, these cells that project to the NTS, where else in the brain do they project to? And I can do that by just looking for these GFP labeled fibers throughout the brain. And when I do that, I see, for instance, areas uh, like the RVLM showing up, which is an important region for uh, cardiovascular control, sympathetic regulation. I see that these cells also project directly to the spinal cord. So again, we're looking at, you know, um, sympathetic regulation. And I think that's really fascinating, suggesting that these cells in the PVN, yes, they project to the NTS where they're doing something, but they also obviously project to other places and that maybe there is some kind of concerted effort from those regions to produce a response of some sort. Um, and I think a lot of that at the moment, based on what I'm seeing, is pointing to sympathetic activation as being hugely important for that pathway. Great. Well, thank you very much, Marie. Uh, there's plenty of more questions, but we're really running out of time here. Mm. For, so I really would like to thank you again on behalf of the Physiological Society for accept accepting this prize, for giving this great lecture uh, that, that we all enjoyed, I believe at least I did. Um, and uh, would, yes, also would like to thank the audience uh, for participating, for all the great questions. And uh, also just want to mention again that hopefully these lectures will also happen live at three or four. Uh, have the venues actually been uh, decided? Mm -hmm. They haven't. So we'll be hopefully next year at a place near you uh, will be uh, a lecture like this. Again, when hopefully COVID permitting, we will all be able to come together again in person. Um, and so, yes, thank you very much to everyone and particularly to Mui and uh, with this, I end this session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Stefan, and thank you everyone for coming.